on behalf of Rico, the Netherlands, a warm welcome to everybody here from Imagine 2012 uh, in Den Bosch in the Netherlands. Uh, with at my table, Vasco van Roosmalen. Vasco, a warm welcome to you. you uh, well, warm. It's not that warm here in the Netherlands. Probably you're used to a better temperature than that. Yeah, a little bit. Uh -huh. Definitely. Uh, were you on stage already or do you still have to no, go on stage? No, I'm, I'm on in a little bit you're on after a little lunch. Bit. Okay, so that's, that's good that you're still uh, Fresh. fresh to go. Um, can you tell me the story about Almir Suroi um, in a couple of sentences? That's, that's hard. It's, uh, he's an, uh, an Indian chief of uh, a tribe in the Amazon, in the Brazilian Amazon. There are about 1,300 of them. And they have had contact with the outside world for 42 years. They made contact with the outside world in 1969. Then before the, that? Before that, they lived as nomadic, uh, uncontacted tribe in the Amazon. And that was the time that the Brazilian government was putting in a road into that region to occupy the Amazon and develop it. That was like straight through the village, right? Yeah, and it went straight through, uh, and it happened to actually go straight through where they were living. And so, so one day they heard noises and they thought, what's happening well, here? That's the interesting thing. I, I talked to Almi's father who passed away last year, and he was 44 at the time of first contact. And once somebody asked him, what was it like when you were living those 44 years before you had contact? And he said, well, we lived a bit in, in anxiety and fear because we knew something was happening. And we had heard from neighboring tribes that other, that, that other people were coming yeah. and that our shamans were told us that when this would come, great disease and great troubles and great challenges would, would, would be brought to us. Those stories were already going, going around. around. And so they knew this was happening. So when the first engineer, road engineers came in after they put in the telegraph lines and they were building the road, the Sui first took up their bows and arrows and they ended up uh, doing several battles with these engineers and, and killing a few and coming out of the forest <laughs> and stealing their tools and everything else. But these engineers and these people kept coming. Yeah. They kept coming. And they, and they had different materials than the bows and arrows. Yes, and uh, and eventually the the leadership of the Sui tribe sat down. They said, "Look, we can't win this with bows and arrows. We're, we we can't win this, and we're going to have to come out and communicate with them." Mm -hmm. and the Brazilian government at the time had the Indian Service, Indian Protection Service, who would go out and contact these tribes and ensure they were pacified as these roads, these Amazon highways, were being built. And so, as we're going to show in a short video it's called Bows and Arrows to Laptops, there's original footage of the government officials putting up mirrors and machetes, uh, really? hanging them in the forest in the Sui, coming out of the forest and taking these machetes really? and, and then making that contact. That was on the 7th of September 1969. 1969, so not 38, 69. 69. Still. Yes. And what, what, let's, let's, maybe if the, if the camera can zoom in a little bit on this picture, what do we see? But this, this is an image from Google Earth, and that's actually one of the really interesting things. Is when you go on Google Earth and you look at the satellite imagery of Brazil and the Amazon, you see large parts in the south which has been deforested, and you yeah. see these patches of green. Yeah, exactly. And really these, patches, like patches, it's straight yeah. lines. Straight lines, and yeah. those, most of those are indigenous areas. Those are traditional lands of indigenous people who have been demarcated. And you call it indigenous areas. Are they also then the owners of the land? They, they have exclusive use rights. That the Brazilian okay. constitution gives them exclusive use rights to, to these lands. They are not the owners. The owners continue to be the Brazilian government and, and the Brazilian society. Yeah. But the constitution gives them exclusive use rights and above any other use rights that anybody else can, any other claims. Mm. And that's a very, very powerful tool. And over 20% of the Brazilian Amazon has been demarcated for indigenous territories. That's over 100 million hectares. That's yeah, 25 times the size of Holland, almost. Yeah, You're yeah. talking, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a huge area. It's about 13% of the Brazilian national territory. So imagine, about 300,000 people, which is the indigenous populations of the Amazon, have control or use rights to 13% of this country, hmm. uh, which has 200 million people in it. So it's a, it's a very interesting, the Constitution gives them this right, but to maintain that right, to use that, that land and to use in it the way they want, and they want to. Yeah. Uh, when they don't have enough of a voting block to elect anyone above a mayor post, for example, which is very hard. So how do you do that? How do you work with the, the society? And even when a lot of that society sees you as obstacles to development, Brazil is, exactly. uh, Brazil is uh, developing ra very rapidly. It has great laws on the book, uh, uh, books and legislation on environment, on yes. indigenous affairs, yeah. but at the same time it clashes with this need for energy, this need for access to natural resources that every country has. So what did Chief Almir do? He went, uh, he started communicating, and that's what yeah. he did. I mean, he, 
he was the first of his tribe who, who got a scholarship and went to the university. Yeah. And then he was called back by his tribe to become chief at 17. His grandfather had been a great chief uh, of his tribe and they'd recognized this in him. And so he came back and was, at the time, these roads, these Amazon roads are built in several stages. So this is first a small road and then it gets expanded, but it's still a dirt road. And so it allows for certain types of development and not others. Yeah. And in that time, they were paving the road with a big World Bank loan. And the World Bank loan required the Hondonia government, the state government, to do compensation programs and to ensure the protection of the indigenous peoples. But that wasn't happening on the ground. Yeah. So the Sui organized themselves and they called Chief Omiya back at 17 for him to, or, to help them communicate that these the paving of this road would bring new disease. And bring, yeah. After first contact, they were, uh, at the time first contact, they were about 5,000 people. A couple of years later, they went down to 290 people because of disease, principally, and, and the effects of first contact. And they lost most of their traditional land. In 1982, they were able to Is get... Is it that vulnerable that yes. as soon as, These, as outside forces come, come and in? And that's to this day. There are about 40 uncontacted tribes in the Amazon still today. How many? 40, at least 40. And how big are those tribes then? Anywhere from family groups to to a couple uh, hundred, or yeah, no, a couple, uh, no, up to a hundred. Okay, uh, perhaps. So there are still uh, uncontact tribes today. They know there's an outside world. We know that. They know that there, there. They know that there are other forces out there, but they've chosen to remain uncontacted. Lucky They're, them. So the well, <laughs> it depends on how you are. There's actually near the Sulawesi territory. Uh, well, if you're looking at yeah. it around in the you world, and sometimes I think like, wow. But they're surrounded by this, yeah. this deforestation. Yeah, yeah, yeah because so all the white areas that you see, that that's all deforested. Uh, yeah. So the what the Brazilian government does, and they actually have a very good program of that. This they when they identify an area where there are uncontacted tribes, they they completely shut it off and they don't allow anybody to come in. Okay. But you can imagine the Amazon is a huge area and yeah. the resources are limited. So, for example, there's a team of 10 Funai officials who are protecting, for example, the last two brothers of one tribe. These are the last two survivors of a tribe who were eliminated by, by farmers. The, the tribe was crossing a, a creek and, and they ended up, uh, most of them being killed. These are the last two brothers who, who live in that area. And that's an area that, that farmers and others really want to get into. And then what stands between them is, are these two last brothers of this tribe and the, the government team that's there to protect them. Hmm. And so they're very much, uh, and, and so uh, Chief Omiya works with that as well. So you're dealing with all these different types of groups. You have groups that have had contact for a very long time, yeah. uh, but live in very isolated regions that we work with, or people like the Sulawi who, are, who have their territory, who have contact for about 40 years or so, but the, the deforestation is right up to the limits of their territory. And, for, and one of the realities that, that they face is that for every tree that disappears on the outside of that territory, the trees that are left in their territory become worth more. Mm. So we're working towards increasing pressure as opposed to decreasing pressure. Mm. As good as the laws are in the book, the economic pressures become ever more. As natural resources become more scarce outside, those who have maintained and managed their resources like indigenous peoples have, and those are still remaining, they become worth more. So the pressure increases, whether it's through co-option, uh, yeah. offering them money for, uh, to have access to those resources, yeah. or even just by force. How does modern technology, because that it's the, the whole story of, of his tribe and what he did is connected to the new technology mm -hmm. like Google, yep. explain how that works. Well, that, they, they see this technology really as a way to communicate with the world. So it's yeah. much more than going on Google and seeing their own territory. They know about their own territory. Yeah. But using a platform like Google Earth with 400 million users and using that to communicate that story, the, the image that you just showed, yeah. as to why that area is still green. Yeah. What, did they have they, yeah. what have they done that's right? And how does that area contribute to all of us? And we uh, know now that it does. Uh, wh wh what do you say to all those modern uh, commercial business people that say, hey, dear Fosco, you know, we are developing the world, so it's all nice in those couple of trees, but hey, guys, we have to move forward. So. Well, that's exactly what the argument in Brazil is, and that's what Chief Omir has always had to deal with, is the, the idea that people say a beautiful forest is a forest that's been cut down and there are cows and soybeans on there, mm. uh, and that's development. But now we know, for example, we face global challenges like climate change, and we know the role that forests play in, in uh, mitigating our, uh, climate change. And so, for example, so we have a, a carbon red project, and it's the first project of its type in Brazil, uh, whether it's indigenous or not indigenous, and it's the first indigenous project of its type in, in the world, mm. where they are getting credits for maintaining their forest and then taking that to the open market to get compensated for that and to get resources to continue to maintain that, that, that forest. We know that 
uh, and that's, that's what Chief, Chief Omi has always said. He says, a living forest is worth more to us as humans and a human society for our well-being and even for our economy than its individual extractable parts. So in fact, we just have if to it, make that argument well. Yeah, so in fact, indigenous people are the most forefront people. It's what we all want to be, because it's the big trend now that everybody has to be green, and we drive electric cars, and we try to save the world. And in fact, that's their way of life, right? That's what they always did. Yeah, because they live so very close to the forest, and that's yeah. what they do through their traditional ways. And, and, yeah. and but at the same time, they are also sealed by because they have contact with the outside world. They like good clothes. They yeah, they yeah. want uh, some of the, the oh, many of the benefits that our society provides. So how do you provide that balance? Are how you, you happy? Provide? Are you happy with the worldwide trend now? Like you know, that everything has to be green. That we have a, that there's a, some kind of a yeah. I must that uh, there's that there's conscious awareness. now awareness. Around the world, that yes, have although to we need, we have to do a lot between there's creating a skeptical, awareness. There's a skeptical smile on your face when I say that. Well, we have to do a lot between awareness and action, action exactly. on the ground. So, so nice, I mean, it's, no it's, smooth talk, but actions. It's nice when we we trade in our our, our gasoline vehicle for a hybrid vehicle, but yeah. there was still there's still a lot of natural resources that went into making that new vehicle. Exactly. So that offsets. Yeah. The, so every time we buy a new car. We still are providing a tremendous impact on the world, and yeah. if you look at where all these materials, like rare earths and others, come from, they have a tremendous impact. And when you're on the ground with people like this, uh, you see that there's still this huge demand for natural natural resources. And for when we're here uh, and we're in a green environment, what we say is a green environment, there we don't see the impact of, of our use of of stuff, and that has to be better. It's not that we have to stop consuming. And that's not what anybody advocates. What I do mean, we have to do then? Uh, we have to be smarter about it, and and we have to make and we have to provide real rational choices, and not just uh, and not just trading one thing for another impact that is just mm. as bad. And so, we can look, for example, if we talk about biofuels, ethanol. Well, ethanol is made by food crops, right? From food crops. Mm. So by by not using oil, but now using food crops. And all the energy that goes into that, and substituting food and making food more expensive, we're creating a huge impact. So, are we really making things better? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe not. Um, to conclude, why do you do this? Why do you do this? Who's Fasco doing this? Why don't you do uh, something else? Well, for one thing, it's it's uh, work that I like. I mean, it's it's my why? profession. Because you get to do. Uh, you get to be this bridge between these very ancient cultures who are facing extraordinary challenges, but have also extraordinary things to contribute yeah. to you personally and to, and you get to help them work in with the rest of the world, in creating bridges and creating that communication. So to be there with a, a team from Google in an Indian village, after you've been there, uh, been with an Indian chief at Google headquarters in Mountain View, yeah, for yeah, example, yeah, yeah. That's it's just cool. very interesting yeah. to be part of that and yeah. to be, and to, to look for solutions because in the end, uh, that's what we have to do. We have yeah. to try to find solutions yeah. for our society because we are not working for the environment. The environment always is there. We're yeah. working for our environment, exactly, and we're yeah. working for the maintenance of our society. And yeah. I like our society. Yeah. Yeah. I like the benefits it brings yeah. 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 to to our people. I wish you all uh, the success and the luck with your activities. I thank hope this small, this small video will help you a little bit. Uh, thank you very much for this thank interview. You. Thank you and so much. And thanks for watching here from Imagine 2012 on behalf of Rico. Bye. Thank you.